Welcome to the new season of the Live Your Spa Life Show. The SPA and SPA Life stands for Seek Power Always, that divine power within you to do what you're here to do. The theme for this season is intentional living. Amazing people like you share ways to live by design and with purpose to ensure that this short ride of life occurs with choice, physically, financially, spiritually, and in your relationships to create a world-class life. In these times of uncertainty, it's time for you to move past the distractions and start trusting yourself more through your God-giving knowingness. No one truly knows better what's best for you than you. In this season, you'll have plenty of examples of people choosing their best life and creating a positive impact through intentional living. Thank you for sharing your precious time with us and being part of the Live Your Spa Life conversation. With us today is Lori Wallace, the founder and CEO of Career Ecology, the hub spot for work-life empowerment. She's mentored job seekers for over 20 years as the owner of her own search agency, where she matched prominent hospital systems like Cedar sinai Kaiser Permanente, and Sutter Health to a skilled and professional professionals ranging from CEO to lab assistants. Lori brings much more that meets the eye. She calls herself a work-life doula, and Lori has a degree in psychology from UCLA and certifications from the Nurtured Heart Institute and Wild Soul School with Mary Reynolds Thompson. She brings a practical and poetic approach to work life across all critical touch points, including job search, resume, interviewing, as well as the touch point to self. Lori, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. And I just wanted to offer two quick gratitudes, if I could. Please. One is we're here because Carol Hodges introduced us. And, you know, being a recruiter, I am a living bumblebee. And so <laughs> I completely appreciate any time that happens. And so I wanted to thank her. And, uh, and then I also just want to call out with gratitude that you are here, radiant, beautiful, and alive. I read your story and I'm blown away. And what you have done and the arc of your life. And here you are still in this next chapter with all of this wisdom and all of this resilience from being a police officer and injuring your hand and what happened with family and all of that, all that trauma and how you've really brought it here now to a sacred place, which I feel podcasting is. Um, there's such a responsibility when we raise our voice to the airwaves. We never know who's going to come in and how chance is going to bring somebody into what we have to say. So I really appreciate that you're here and I'm just grateful that you're still alive and kicking. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Lori. Thank you so much for that. And that's actually one of the reasons that I got into podcasting is, you know, it's the one place where people can really have a reflection because people will see the success of people, but they don't see the journey, right? They don't see what's behind the scenes, and especially as entrepreneurs, you know, that it's a bumpy ride. And there are a lot of things that, that happen along the way. And all of it matters, right? All of our experiences come into who we are. And especially, you know, at this stage of our life to be able to take all of that experience and be able to look at it and have people go, okay, this is where I am. You never want to compare yourself to somebody's finish line when you're at the start or you're in the middle or where you're at and to be able to utilize that to help you move along the way, um, I think is a really powerful thing. And you know, you view the realm of work as the ideal uh, touch point in healing the world. I'd love for you to touch a little <laughs> bit more on what that means. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's a big statement, isn't it? Um, you know, interestingly, I came to this work um, because of 9-11. So, you know, this work is my soul work. Um, I was 36 and I was pregnant with my one and only child. And when the Twin Towers fell, I went into labor. Uh, my husband had to take me to the hospital. And let me tell you something. There were a lot of women in the emergency room birthing babies. We ultimately are animals. And um, I, I turned into a possum and I was trying to kind of push him out and save us and manage with the help of doctors and, and pharmacists to keep my baby in. But I ended up feeling obviously this new world that we were in, um, experiencing here in America and um, ended up being laid off with a brand new baby. And at the time, you know, everything, and then I, and I hit this autoimmune issue. So um, at the time I said, you know, I'm going to leave banking and I want to practice radical kindness. 
And my husband said, great, great career choice. You know, where's that? Yeah, where's that going to be? And, you know, it was so central. And I thought, well, and I'm 36 and I'm, I'm applying to jobs like paychecks and certain things because I thought, well, here, you know, maybe an independent business, a dry cleaner will feel like I've got Lori on my side to make sure my payroll's good. And I thought, no, no, you know, and they'll feel this sense, this wave of unconditional love. I mean, this is, you know. And I realized, well, everyone's 21 that's going for that. Maybe I should <laughs> go that way. So ultimately, my recruiter called me and recruited me to be a recruiter, ultimately. And um, and so long story short, I became a recruiter in Oregon, moved my family there, but realized that while this work was so critical because it's a transition point for humans, one job to another, maybe after a layoff, you know, I found that recruiting itself was more of a sales organization. And, uh, and I still was feeling this deep sense of need to heal and support people when they're at their utmost vulnerable, you know, because you and I both know the vulnerability is if your love life is out of whack, something's, something's breaking your heart or your health, like what happened to your hand, what happened to me and my autoimmune and work, any one of those three is suffering or wounded, we're really off balance. And um, so I started my own agency and said, you know, I really want to be there for people and I want to listen deeply to what's going on when they find me. Now, keep in mind, when I was back at the recruiting firm, um, the general manager would be there with his watch and timing my calls to six minutes. And that wasn't long enough to hear the story about someone's layoff and the betrayal that they felt from being at that company for 10 years and then laid off in a moment's notice. Mm -hmm. It didn't speak to the trauma that um, they're responsible for five children and they decided that their spouse would stay home with the kids. And now would they be able to keep their house? Also, um, with the job search that they were already under, that they're being ghosted and it makes them feel unlovable or maybe that they have nothing to offer. This would be coming from CEOs even, you know, it doesn't wow. matter to what level um, somebody had ascended to. I noticed that there was something primal and, uh, you know, our nervous systems have developed um, much slower than our modern world. And when we're ghosted, from that, when you apply and no one replies back, and we all know what ghosting feels like, even friends, you know, on text or whatever, it really reminds us at a primal level that potentially we'll be eaten outside the cave, that we've been kicked out one way or another. And it turns out that job seeking triggers that emotion and it triggers this sense of um, like, you might die, you might end up on the street. And many people do, you know, the homeless people that we see out there have gone through a horrible event with work and never were able to get their balance again. Right. So yeah, go yeah, ahead. It's interesting that, you know, I think like when our, our parents were, you know, I think of like my dad who was in federal service for 43 years, you know, and, and people talk about being in professions for, you know, 30 years and, and getting 30 minutes of fame and getting a, a watch out the door kind of thing. And now we see there's so much uh, you know, people moving from things that are completely different uh, in each stage of the way. And I know you talk a lot about uh, job transition as being the modern day hero's journey. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and how that actually feels in the body and, and how is that different now for, uh, you know, not just us, but like our kids where it's like, how, how do we look at the job world now in terms of just the bouncing around that happens? Oh my gosh. First of all, that question just gave me chills. <laughs> My left brain. Um, so on point that you brought up the kids too. Um, so what I'm realizing is that, you know, the hero's journey, Joseph Campbell talks about that hero's journey where you are thrust out into the dark woods. And once you're out there, there's a wound, there's a slash to the thigh um, that, you know, the hero has to deal with. And you know, so there's that initial wounding, which maybe a layoff is, or even it can feel very scary in terms of kids. It can feel like a wounding to come out of school with huge school loans and no sense. How do you get a job when it keeps saying you need two years of experience, you know, and um, maybe you can't live where your parents live, or maybe you don't want to live with your parents live and then you're alone. And what do you deal, you know, you know all these dynamics and social so what happens is when you think about it in terms of the hero's journey, it maps perfectly. So you're, you're thrust out into exile, into this place where you see no path. Um, maybe, you know, if we think about the woods analogy, um, maybe we're always walking through the woods, right? We're in the wild. But when it's something that we're familiar with, we can turn back and we can see the beaten path and we can make our way back to our car in the parking lot. 
But when you have been laid off or you're in these huge transition places, suddenly you can't see the path anymore. If you look over your shoulder, all of those trees and boulders look unfamiliar. And if you try to go backwards, you get more lost. So finally, there's this point where you have to stop and you have to look up and you have to listen and you have to turn on a new navigation system. Now, the thing is, this new navigation system is actually the navigation system we've always had as human beings, but that has been somewhat turned off in this modern world. And what it really is, is the mind and heart um, alignment. It's where your heart is your primary sovereign and it's the sensory organ. You know, it radiates 5,000 times greater than the brain. It's the one that attaches to attraction that can sense and intuit. It's the one that goes towards love and compassion, not just self-preservation. Um, of course, if you know the dark woods, there is some self-preservation going on there. <laughs> so there's a good balance. But that whole hero's journey, once you've got the wound, if you recall in the story, then there's a falling in love, a falling out of love. Um, there's a dragon. There's all of this going up and down mountains. And then finally, at the end of the hero's journey, you're more resilient. You have more skills. You've learned that you can survive and you come back to community with new gifts. Now, mm. not everybody makes it all the way through though, Diane. Some people find a stump and they sit down and they get very scared or very angry or very lonely. And all different sorts of things can happen there. Um, isolation, addiction, distractions. And so the idea is for all of us to teach this art of transition where we turn on the heart as compass and we come into the sacred union of community. Everything that we were born to do as humans, but we've turned off here in the United States that is ruggedly independent and says that you must be an extrovert and you have to be all about dominance and power. And the truth is we need this masculine and feminine in a beautiful marriage together and having that feminine and that care and that, that love and that intuition on point for the job search in the interview. It's actually a loving act. Who knew? Mm, got it. <laughs> yeah, who knew? <laughs> you know, you talk a little bit about, you know, part of that journey is, you know, there's fears that, that can come up and you yeah. have a term about agnostic mentoring, right? Mm. And so how, how does that look like in the process? Yes. And you know, it's, I love that you said agnostic. I'm going to think about that. It's antagonistic mentoring, but you know ah! what? I <laughs> love chance. So I am thinking about that. I am, this is, I am a huge uh, chance woman. Um, one of the things I know before I get to that good question is that I tell everybody that life is 50% your engagement, one half five Oh, and the other half is chance and the mystery and everything that happens outside of your control. Mm. And I say, isn't that great? So you're not fully responsible. But the key is how do you come back into a sacred dance with chance? How do you actually, like right now, chance is my strategic partner. You know, how do I engage with that instead of shut it out and just think I'm responsible for everything? Mm -hmm. So antagonistic mentoring somewhat comes into that concept. Um, so I, I use that term because I sat in one day in a fascinating seminar with Michael Mead, and he is a wonderful podcaster who is an expert in mythology. And he's a fascinating story. Um, and so he just comes forward and tells a myth story that is um, alive today. These old, old stories and fairy tales, are, we're still living them out. You know, all of these types of things, you know, flying too close to the sun, you know, you can see those, e that kind of ego narcissism. It's like, you know, all of that kind of stuff is going on. And so I was sitting in one of his seminars in Santa Monica. And he was talking about this age and this time we're in. And he said, it's very important that youth and elders. And he said, and by the way, when I say elders, I don't mean olders. I'm talking about people that grow in age and grow in wisdom and lean into the fire of, of crisis and learn and grow. And they can be an elder for the youth and the youth who hold on to idealism. So we need these two coming together. And really the elders are mentors. Well, when he said that, a young woman in the back raised her hand and she said, excuse me, Michael, um, I don't know about that. And he said, tell me more. She said, um, well, I graduated college and I wanted to be a writer. And I asked my favorite professor to be my mentor. And he said, yes. And we had a regular day each week. And I came in with my draft and my manuscript. And he was 
jealous or something. I mean, he was so critical. He, there wasn't anything that I felt that I could learn from. It was the most toxic, toxic experience. So I quit that and I quit writing. I mean, all together, I left what I love. So I don't know about this mentoring thing. Mm -hmm. And he said, okay. He goes, well, let me ask you this. What are you doing now? She said, well, I work for a local playhouse and I help the plays, um, you kind of work them through to the stage and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And he said, do you like what you're doing? And she said, oh my God, I absolutely love it. And he said, huh, do you think you want to write a thank you note to your professor? <laughs> and she just went, oh, and he said, <laughs> folks, he said, mentoring, the one that gets you further down your path and the fastest is the antagonistic mentor. Mm -hmm. And so that can be the hand injury. That can be the illness. It can be the layoff. It can be the end of a friendship. Things that just really just bring you to your knees in devastation and that force you to take a look and look up again like the dark woods. Where am I? What's going on? What's my navigation? And you realize, oh my gracious. So when I think back, and I told you before that I worked for another recruiting agency, and now I have my own. I owe a thank you note to that agency who was doing it in a way that I didn't appreciate. It was very businessy and six minutes on the call and that kind of stuff and other things. But had that, had I not had that experience that kind of kicked me out of Oregon and I felt at the time could have been a failure with an experience or experiment, um, it was an antagonistic mentor moment. Um, mm -hmm. I had to see it and feel it for all the, all the things that, that made me crazy you know, yeah. um, so many of those, you must have so many in your life too, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, God, my, my mind's going in so many different directions and I always look at, I, I always believe there's no mistakes and especially, you know, bringing up that whole agnostic and because there's a part about trusting yourself and having faith and being able to trust that whatever path that you're on, that it's showing you something, that there's something there. And I think there's one of the things that, uh, I think that's come up and I think people see like, especially young people, they'll see like these YouTube sensations and it's like, I'm going to work in my basement and I'm going to just, you know, earn online and not have to connect with other people. And, and because yeah. we have so many of these resources of, you know, even just texting to people or having like these online friendships, although they've expanded our world and they're amazing, we still need to build those skills to have that one-on-one -on -one conversations like you and I talking right now, even though we're not in the same room, we are able to see each other. We're able to have these conversations, but nothing really replaces that aspect of it. And a lot of times that journey does look like hard work. It looks like, you know, we want to bring in, you know, what is our, uh, we feel good about, but there's also that kind of grit uh, aspect of doing the challenging things. And um, in fact, there was a recent statistic that came out of the 70-30 rule. And then I talk a lot about this when I do training where, you know, you want to love like 70% of what you're doing, but there is 30% of your job that it's not your favorite things to do, right? It's, right? it's not those things that are like, I'm loving every minute what I'm doing. However, doing those steps lets me spend more time in that loving space. Can you talk a little bit about that when people are maybe in that um, disillusionment, if you will, of choosing their path and doing what they're doing, going, well, this is not what I thought it was gonna be and it's harder than I thought. And you know, especially if you're balancing family and just all, all the things that come into it that people don't necessarily uh, tell you along the way. And I think that's where some of the disillusionment can come and where you can get a little bit lost in the woods. Oh, yes. A good tie back. I love that. And yeah, the agnostic, it's really making sense to me now. I love this. You know, you're making me think of uh, a post I recently wrote on Substack about Viktor Frankl. Um, he is a psychologist um, that lived at the time of the Holocaust. He was a Jewish man who was kidnapped and he was taken to the camps with his pregnant wife and his mother and his father and his brother. And very sadly, all of them died on the gas chambers and various things. And he miraculously, though, did not die. And he left and was able to study the human condition. Um, obviously, being in the camps as somebody who would observe others, he was able to really try to sense into what was going on. And you know what's so fascinating about that is, um, is that he came out realizing that um, Freud's idea that at the base of the human condition is pleasure he said, oh no, he said, that's not it. He said, actually the base motivation is meaning. 
Um, now Adler was another famous psychologist and he said it's power and belonging. Well, we know these are all important things, but ultimately it's meaning. So what Viktor Frankl said was, if you don't have meaning in your life because of the potential of the human being, because of our brain right now, you and I could even have another conversation just about outer space and existentialism. And we could imagine our ancestors and imagine our great, great, great grandchildren and try to even write a story about that. All of that potential that we have makes us an extraordinary species and a very dangerous species. Because if we don't have meaning, we need somehow to address that. So what happens is, is that we go to um, the first level of finding meaning or trying, which is what Freud said, which is pleasure. So look at the way that our capitalistic society it is. You know, it's all about having money, fame, you know, really just distracting towards pleasure. Um, COVID stopped that in the tracks. So people had to kind of come back, start to make bread right away. But, you know, there was still this like, what, you know, what's, what's life? I mean, there's been a paring down to the core a bit because of COVID. If mean, if pleasure doesn't do it, then there can be going to cults, organizations where you find value outside of yourself because maybe you belong to something bigger than you. And we see that all sorts of things. And then after that, violence. So the interesting thing is to realize meaning is something to consciously be aware of and to cultivate. So first of all, um, I want to go ahead and I'm going to say, I want to tell one quickie little story about that. And then I want to ask you a question, Diane. I'm going to take you through an exercise if you're game. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> um, so I want to give you a sense of a story of a man with meaning, a brief story that I observed. I mentioned to you that I lived in Oregon and I was a recruiter. Um, one day I came out of the elevator, fourth floor, I opened the doors open and there are about five workers, five men, very busily pulling up all of the industrial carpet. Um, tearing it from the floor and all the glues and they had all of their, you know, they, all of their manu equipment, you know, I'm, I'm so hammers, whatever <laughs> they had everything and, um, big, big things too, that look kind of dangerous. So I'm tiptoeing. I go to my office. I come back at five o'clock, the new carpet, as you can imagine, you know, the industrial carpets just super flat. It has, you know, some geometric shapes or whatever. So this carpet has been laid. Everyone is gone except for one man. He is lying on his stomach, on his belly, with his face turned with his cheek on the floor so he could see just the flatness or the horizon in a way of the carpet. And in his right hand, he had a pair of scissors and he was snipping the fuzzies off the top. I realized this man was attentive to beauty. And I wanted, and I should have, I was a younger woman at the time. I just, I had an impression, as you can see, it's never left me. But had I been the woman I am now, I would have stopped and said, tell me about beauty. I have a feeling that he's a painter or he's a gardener or he's a cook and you know, he's, he's attentive to beauty. So obviously there's deep meaning for this man that he came into a carpet layer job and he was snipping the little fuzzies. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I have this little exercise I want to ask you. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you these four questions and you get to answer them just really pretty plainly and basically, and then you'll see they'll get deeper. So like the first one, I'm going to say, what's your job? And if someone asked me, you know, I would say, I mean, one of them, I have many, I'm sure you have a thousand too, but I would say, so pick one, you know, but, or you can list them, but I'd say I'm a recruiter. That's one, you know, the other is obviously empowerment. Um, so, okay. You ready? So I'm going to go yep. boom, down, down four levels. Okay. First question is what's your job? Empowerment. And what purpose is in that work? For people to see their value. And what meaning do you derive from that purpose? Helping people find their place in the world. Mm, okay. And now our last, you can see we're going dropping, dropping. Some people can really only say job, bless them, and they can't get to purpose. They're mm. not allowed to. They don't have space. You have very easily come down to meaning. Now, mm. we might think we're done, but I realize I'm very inspired by Viktor Frankl, but there's one more level. And the level is... What is your soul fire? What is it about you that actually draws in that meaning, that speaks to that purpose, that has you showing up in that work that you do? What is your own soul fire, would you say? Mm. What always comes to me is the path of F, right? To me, that is faith, it's family, it's friends, and it's freedom. And it's how all of those intermingle together. 
Mm, beautiful. I can see that from your story. And you can see how you need to do things where that's always at play. So it's bringing you meaning, but it's really fueled by that fire. And what I find with a lot of the people that come across my desk or that I get to meet, um, they've been denied that fire. Um, you know, Gabor Mate has his beautiful book out. He has his movie, um, The Wisdom of Trauma. You know, he has he's so much out right now where he talks about the initial trauma that we all feel as humans is that any moment we're denied authentic connection to self, that is the most damaging trauma there is. And when we come out as little people, you know, we're um, very much beholden to whatever adult is in our life and whatever um, trauma they've also experienced and whether or not they've been able to walk through that wound, that window of wound, because it is walking on those hot coals to alchemize into that wisdom person. And so to know that your fire is so many people have locked it away. It's not only pushed back into the cave with boulders, but it's now starved of oxygen. Mm -hmm. So what I'm doing when I'm working with people is we are tearing away any of those barriers and we're getting back and we're like, let's bring some oxygen to that soul fire. And, you know, when people say, you know, this is the job I need, you know, I ask them for three different, I'll say, okay, what's your, what are you good at? Like, what job are you, you know, thinking that you can do and that you would be hired for? And then second thing, I'll say, all right, what's sort of divergent? And the third, I'm like, what's out of the box? Let's really, you know, let's put some oxygen on that fire. I had this one woman who I asked that question to, and she's a pharmacist. And she said, well, I could be a outpatient pharmacist, more divergent. She said, maybe I could do consulting of that work. And then I said, all right, what's your out of the box? Bring it. Come on. She said, I'm embarrassed. And I said, no, I think it's just us. She said, I'm getting my certification for library science. I said, that's the most awesome thing. You want to be a librarian? She said, Lori, I'm just totally fixated on books and the idea of the network of knowledge. And I said, well, the fact that you just said that to me, we just played with chance. My co-counselor when I was 16 at St. Matthew's Day Camp is the dean of library of the library at Stanford Medical school or whatever over there you want to have lunch with her they had lunch and now she's working there as a librarian so <laughs> i love so it put fire yeah you can put the oxygen on the fire absolutely <laughs> oh it's so good you know and again that's more f's for me right fueling and fire and really looking at those deep things about why you're here and you yes. know it, this really ties us back into that 30 percent that can feel challenging mm. if you're coming from that place of what fuels you and where that fire is that 30 percent mm. isn't as hard like you're willing to jump and do all of those things because you know what it's fueling and you know what it's leading up to and really coming full circle with that and i i love um what you're saying about that and you know along those lines one of the things i always love to ask my guests because our environment actually creates our experience. And so I love to know, like we live differently in our kitchen versus our bedroom or our office. What's your favorite room in your home and why? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I hope it's not cheating to say it's actually this little cottage, if you can see behind me. It's, um, it's, it's, it's my little birdhouse in a way. It's in the back of my home and it was built during COVID. And um, because we have a house, kind of an open, San Diego has these open designs, the kitchens in the middle of absolutely everything, which is fabulous. But to be in COVID with a senior in high school, my son, who is a Mustang, but at that time should have been, you know, basic, well, actually that even has, that's his mascot, the Mustangs, I just realized, but they should have been out running. And he was stuck in his room, missing his senior year because of COVID. Very, very upset. My husband and I were very concerned about his mental health. I had a lot of work going on, a lot of conversations going on that he was going to be privy to or he was going to be bothered by. And so I looked at my husband and I said, it's time to build my birdhouse, you know, my own little place where I can go. And since then, you know, we ordered the kit. It came over the ocean. Remember how slow everything was, but it came. <laughs> it's been snapped together. And since it's been built, I have opened and become a poet. Um, and so I write poetry here. Emily Dickinson is um, my god and goddess and hero and heroine. Um, I watched the Dickinson series on Apple, which blew my mind and just changed my life. And so I sit here and do the work of being a doula as well as a poet, because ultimately, just like what Goethe says, and he's just one of the people I follow as well, 
is that, you know, he was involved in 10 million things, you know, he was a scientist and a chef and a mayor and a painter. And someone said, dude, <laughs> what are you, you know, come on, pick one. And he said, hmm. well, maybe my whole thing is that I just bring poetic form to everyday life. And I heard that and I said, yeah, that's me. So this space is where I can do that. I yeah. love it. So great. <laughs> well, I know that our listeners are going to stay in contact with you, Lori. How can they do that? Yes. Come on over to careerecology.com forward slash spa. I've created a little spot where I'm going to share my highlights and just what touched me and all my chill points from our conversation. And I have also some treats and some offers for anybody that wants to come in and say hi. So again, that's careerecology.com forward slash spa, of course. <laughs> love it. Love it. So good. Well, as you know, our theme for this season is intentional living. In what way are you living an intentional life today? Being here with you. Mm, Honestly, you. I'm now I'm getting my truth chairs. I, so this is weird. I sit in uh, boardrooms and I have conversations. I'm doing a CEO, CEO search or something. And I'm talking with people, uh, you know, what's going on. And if something hits me, that's really intensely true. I well up in tears and I have to always warn people. I say that is actually how spirit um, comes through and talks to me. And I mean spirit in terms of the, the, the life force that animates that piece of grass that's growing between the sidewalk cracks. You know, it's that spirit that animates life. And um, just being here with you right now is very intentional. I lit some of my sage beforehand. I put on my little you know, little beads mm -hmm. and, and I offered my gratitudes and I really felt you know, what I said at the beginning, I'm really, really grateful that you are alive. You have grandchildren and that you are offering this gift to the world. And it's just a very intentional moment to slow everything down and be here with you. So sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. So good. Well, thank you mm -hmm. so much for being here and sharing your wisdom and your hero's journey. Thank you very much. Have a beautiful day. Uh, thank you. And for our listeners out there, Wow, this was a very packed time. And, you know, no matter where you are in your life, look at your own hero's journey. Where are you at? You know, are you are you in the woods and you maybe have some questions and you can absolutely reach out to myself or Lori to help you navigate that? You know, are you on the other side, you know, at, at this point and you are now that sage wise person that you can now, uh, you know, shed that light? You know, a lot of times we don't share that wisdom and the things that we have. And so that's why people end up being kind of lost because they don't know who to look for. For, for that mentor and to be that for other people. So maybe you are that person. Wherever you are in your stage, please share this, get it out there, you know, examine our life, right? A life not examined, right? We see the gaps that are in there. And even if we feel like we're at the end of, of, of that journey, that also probably means it's time to spark another journey, right? There's, I look at it as there's never retirement, you know, there's just renegotiation and looking at how we are to be here in the world. So look at all the things that you're bringing to the world. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for all you do. And until we connect again, live your spa life. Bye for now. Bye-bye.